morning, good people. Welcome to Lunching with Books. I'm Harold Plunkett. I'll be your host today. Uh, thank you very much for being here. We have a great program in store for you. I want to thank our volunteers. We've got Ron back there, one of our money changers, and, and Shirley. And then, of course, we have the Hillmans back there serving the food. And uh, so anyway, thank you all very much for your, for your help and uh, for volunteering. Um, I also want to thank Bonnie Gaines. Of course, she's on staff here, the administrative assistant. She's the one that does all the background work and gets all this stuff done. Uh, and of course, we always want to thank Jeff Tomlinson, the director here, for his leadership. On your tables, you'll see some envelopes. And um, if you would be interested in uh, joining the Friends of the Library, um, it's real simple. Just take the card with you, and you can mail it back. Uh, I think it's uh, $15 for, or 10 for one person, 15 for two. So put a $20 bill in there and send it in. Um, coming up in future months, every fourth Wednesday, uh, June 28th. Uh, Dr. Francis Williams will review uh, Ron Chinnow's uh, biography, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, you may recall this author also wrote uh, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, um, a book on the life of uh, John Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan. He's got some really, really interesting biographies. So I know uh, Dr. Williams would do a great job. Um, so she'll be doing Grant. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this, but um, General Grant was a frequent visitor to Mississippi. Uh, he, had a, he had a real fondness for the city of Pittsburgh, <laughs> uh, so much that he wanted to take it. So uh, that, should be, uh, that should be very interesting. Uh, Steve Holland will be here on July 26th, and he'll review Robert Kayak's book, 60, A Year of Sports, Race, in politics. It's a fascinating read. Uh, I've, I've read that book myself. It's, a, it's really a fascinating book on not only a, the life of Robert Kayak, who's an interesting character in and of himself, but about his father, who was also an interesting character, and just all the things that were going on at that time in civil rights and sports. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really a good, a good read. Uh, then August 23rd, we'll have Joe Ed Morris, who will review his own book, a work of fiction. It's a crime thriller. It takes place right here in Mississippi in the 20 mile bottom and it's entitled The Devil Walks at Midnight, the 20 mile bottom tale. Ooh. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, and uh, we're currently seeking a speaker for September. So if you have any suggestions, I'm open to that. You can reach me at uh, herald at sanctuaryhospice.org. That's pretty easy, herald at sanctuaryhospice.org. And uh, feel free to send me your suggestions. Otherwise, you'll have to put up with who I get. So um, uh, anyway, so um, we're going to have some fun today. And, and we're delighted to have a, a very accomplished uh, individual uh, in Randy McCoy. Randy McCoy, he, his wife uh, Janice is also here somewhere. I saw her early. There's the, his lovely wife Janice right there. Um, we're glad to have her with us. Uh, but anyway, we're delighted to have Randy with us today. Uh, Dr. McCoy is a native of Tupelo, retired from a career education. He's been interim, uh, interim superintendent of Meridian Public School District in 2011 after serving as superintendent uh, for four other school districts. He came to Tupelo. He was there from 02 to 09 as our superintendent. He served on a number of board of trustees for the public uh, employee retirement system, and he enjoys an active retirement as a photographer, a licensed pilot, a motivational speaker, an amateur magician, a scuba diver, and a Sunday school teacher. Now, how about that? So uh, maybe he'll share some of all of that with us today, but help me welcome Dr. McCoy.
how does a man whose name had the power to enrage the highest military brass that we had in the United States and some presidents, whose name terrified settlers and, and encouraged them to bolt their windows and lock their doors for protection, whose name sent locals running to local officials begging for protection, and who would eventually become the most wanted man in America. How does that man come to symbolize courage, wild abandon, daring, and leadership? And he symbolizes such courage uh, that it would be so revered that the World War II paratroopers, as they leapt out of the planes going into battle, would yell out Geronimo to stand for bravery, resourcefulness, and patriotism such that the United States Navy SEALs, when they, uh, they would use the code name for their mission to kill Osama bin Laden was called Operation Geronimo. This today is going to be the story of that man, Geronimo. Now it was written by Mike Leach and Buddy Levy. Mike Leach, when he grew up, he grew up in Cody, Wyoming. Uh, as he was a boy, he liked to play cowboys and Indians. He always wanted to be the Indians. He thought the Indians were the toughest. They had the most resourcefulness, making do with what they had. And the greatest of all of the Indians was the Apache Geronimo. And he said that greatness, no matter where it was, that people just wanted to be around it. They wanted to feel it. They wanted to see it. They wanted to be in the presence of it. And greatness is respected by all cultures. And, and Geronimo personified this life of excellence. And others around him followed him. You see, Geronimo was never a chief. Never was. But people followed him to their death. He, uh, Mike Leach said he read about him extensively when he was a little boy, had his mother read to him and explain the stories about Geronimo. And he had pictures in his offices. And he even talked about Geronimo in some of the press conferences after football games. So then his historian that wrote with him was uh, Buddy Levy. Now, Buddy wanted to write a book about Geronimo. And he had a, uh, the litera same literary agent that Mike Leach did. Mike Leach was out promoting his board swing, uh, his book, Swing Your Sword. And he was on ESPN three hours a day, five days a week, and he just didn't have time. Now, he was not coaching at that time. But in that following summer, he was recruited and he went to Washington State University as, as, a, as a coach. He had been there less than a week when the secretary comes in and said, uh, Coach Leach, there's a history professor here to see you. And he goes to the door. The guy says, I'm Buddy Levy, and let's write that book about Geronimo. And they did. Geronimo, his early life was all about discipline. And he was born on the upper reaches of the uh, Gila River. If I can get my pointer to maybe work, which maybe it's not going to work, but I'll tell you. The problem that we got, he said he was born on the forks. There's two forks on that river. Well, we don't really know where he was born, but he always claimed to have been born there in um, uh, Arizona. There are four main Chiricahua tribes. There's the, uh, let's see if I can back that up. There's the Bendokohi tribe. That's his tribe here in these mountains, in the Pino Altos Mountains. The Chocononan was Cochise. Over here was Coach, Vi I mean, uh, Chief Victorious. And down here was one of his friends named Wo, the Nedney tribe. These were the four tribes of the Chiricahua Indians. 
his entire boyhood was rigorous training, preparing to be a, a warrior, gathering food, uh, physical fitness, mental toughness. One of the things that they did for the young men, they would have to run 10 miles, five miles up a mountain, 10, uh, five miles back down with water in their mouth. And if they didn't still have the water when they got back, they had to do it again. The deal was they wanted to be tougher than anyone else. In their teen years, when they started training to be warriors, the warrior training was very simple. It was to make sure that you had immense self-discipline, a strong mind, legs and lungs that were so developed that there was no one that could outrun the Apache warrior. Uh, here's a great game, playing dodgeball. They played with rocks. <laughs> the, the other thing that they would do is get about 50 feet apart, and when they were 50 feet apart, they would shoot arrows at one another like dodgeball. Now, they weren't the sharp tips. They were dull, but they could hurt if it hit you. Uh, so the, uh, but now in the territory, and this is the territory of the Chiricahua Indians. Uh, just so you'll know, this is El Paso here. Here is Tombstone. You keep going that way, you get the other cities of Arizona. In the red box there is the San Carlos Indian Reservation where eventually they wanted to put all of the uh, Chiricahua. But um, in their training, in their late teens, they would have to go on five raids. Four raids, they were always kept back and there was a mentor that talked to them about all of the activities that were going on, the skills, the strategies that was needed as they were doing the raid. They did that four times. On the fifth raid, they were able to participate. And once they could uh, participate, they became a warrior. And when they became a warrior, they could take a wife. Geronimo was 17 when he took his wife. Her name was Alope of the uh, Nedney Apache Indians. They had three children, and they were living the great life of Apache in the Apache way. Family was extremely important to the Apache. Community was extremely important. His daddy died when he was about 20. His mother's teepee was next door to his, and it was an honor and a privilege to take care of your parents in their later years. You need to understand about the Apache, there's three things. There's raiding, war, and tiswin. Raiding, all that's about is getting things that we need to survive. Horses, mules, food, guns, ammunition. The goal was to get in and get out, no bloodshed. Go identify the horses that you want, use switches to drive them out of the corral so they could get them and carry them back, and then run as fast and as far as you could to outrun the people chasing you. No bloodshed in a raid if they could keep from it. What about the war then? Well, war was completely different in that war itself meant killing as many of the enemy as possible. I'm not going to be politically correct today. I'm going to talk a little bit about bloodshed because the Southwest was a violent place in which to live. They attacked towns where their kinsmen had been killed. It was about revenge, and revenge was about killing the other person. Uh, one of the things that happened was, was, was this. The conquistadors, when they came to Mexico, they traveled up into the southwestern part of what is now the United States, and when they got there, the Apache said, how y'all doing? We've been here for years and years and years. Welcome. Well, that's when they got the horse back uh, in, introduced. The horse was actually here in North America for a while. It went extinct, and they brought it back. But they could uh, ride a horse, hang on to the mane, pitch up, pick up a rabbit off the ground, and never get off the horse. They were excellent horse people. The well-trained Apache could fire seven arrows, and the seventh one would be released before the first one ever hit the first target. That was well-trained, the well-trained warrior. 
Tiswin. Tiswin was their liquor, corn liquor. The ladies made that for them. They used it in a ceremonial celebrations in their rituals after they had gone out and raided and, 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 or, or been on a war party or whatever, if they were successful, they would come in and the party generally lasted about four days. And most of it was with a hangover. <laughs> <coughs> the things were happening now. He was born in 1823. In 1846 through 1851, there were a lot of things that were happening in the United States of America. In 1846, War broke out between the United States and Mexico. Uh, two powers, they were fighting over the Southwest, that's all the land that was Southwest of the Louisiana Purchase, and the United States won it. That resulted in the Treaty of Guadalupe, uh, Hildago, and in that treaty, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Wyoming, Utah, California, that whole area became part of the United States of America. And, and, and what actually happened was this. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute. But what you had was two countries deciding where the property lines were. The only problem was they didn't talk to the Apache. The Apache had been there so many more years. Uh, a little bit later, uh, in 1851, when Geronimo was 28, he and his wife, family, they went down to Mexico. Now, southwestern uh, United States, where they were, they were in uh, southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico, and northern Mexico, Sonora, and Chihuahua states is where their region was. So they, they had gone down to, and I'm going to use American pronunciation for all these names. They went to Janos in Mexico. They had, and what they did was when they got to these towns and villages, they would send messengers in and say, we're here in peace. We want to trade. And if they agreed to do that, they would trade. Well, it was agreed that they would trade with them. They camped outside of Janos. The warriors go into town. They're doing their trading. And when they come back, soldiers from another town had attacked the village uh, or the campment of the Apaches. And at that raid, Geronimo lost his wife, his mother, and three children were killed there. Of course, the soldiers took all of their horses and all of their supplies, and they walked all the way back to Arizona to where, to where they uh, uh, actually lived. Janos was in this part. They were actually in the Chihuahua State down here. Remember, they lived up here. So they, they walked back. Geronimo did not walk with the tribe. He was always behind the tribe. He was mourning. When they got back to their homeland, he went to his mother's teepee, gathered up her belongings, burned them. Went into his teepee, saw the artwork that his wife had done, the beadwork and all of that, the playthings of his children, gathered all that together, burned it. That was the tradition of the Apaches. Why did they do that? To keep the family fighting over stuff. They just did away with it. Then there would be no brothers or sisters fighting over those sorts of things. Now, he was in mourning. So he goes deep into the mountains of the Chiricahua Indians. And he, he probably went up into these mountains right in here. While he was up there, he was praying and fasted. He was a deeply religious man. He played, prayed to his Apache God, which was Usen, U-S-S-E-N. While he was there, he heard a voice speak to him four times. On the fourth time it spoke to him, the voice said, bullets will not kill you, and I will guide your arrows. When he came back from the mountains, he vowed to take revenge on the Mexicans, and this vengeance would fuel him the rest of his, his life. Now, the Apache believed that their God would give them powers. Now, his power was a healer. 
He was a uh, shaman. He was, uh, uh, of course, the big power that no bullet had ever killed him. Now, that was a good one. In fact, Mike Leach said about it, he said, you can be brave, you can be resourceful, you can take a lot of risk, especially if you know that no bullet's going to kill you. <laughs> now, that's, I, so he would intersperse these things in there, but Geronimo had several powers, and one of them was he could foretell events and then tell you specific things about those events even though they were miles and miles away. And that occurred three or four times that other Indians documented. Uh, some of the Indians could predict weather, understand animals, uh, and even foretell uh, when the enemy was coming. One of the women warriors, her name was Lozen, and she was from Chief Victorio's tribe. Uh, and, and the way she did it is it was described that she would hold her hands out, palms upward, and would spin and dance. And if there was enemy nearby, her palms would get hot and turn red. And she could literally tell you where they were and where they were coming from and possibly when they would be there. And that is documented from other Apaches that they could actually do that. Coach Leach wanted us to know in writing this book that uh, everyone is a product of their environment, everybody. Geronimo was shaped by the landscape where he lived, the people's history, tradition, religion, his core beliefs, but the United States military was going to try to yank them out of that and put them on a reservation. Geronimo had much respect for his family and was totally dedicated to them. Oh, Geronimo is not his name, just so you'll know that. His Indian name is Goyakla. Now, how did he get Geronimo? Well, he got his name Geronimo when his war path began. His two mentors was his chief, Chief Coloradus and Cochise. He went to them a year later and he said, it's time for us to go take revenge on those Mexicans. And they went down there, and as he got down there, they, uh, what they, the, because he was such a leader at this age, they allowed him, a non-chief, to lead this party. When they got down there, the outside of Janos, the soldiers sent eight people out to parley with them. Uh, big mistake. Uh, they killed them in sight of their other friends. So they did that, hoped to draw out the rest of the soldiers. Man, that worked. They came out. The next day, I think they fought almost all day, and there wasn't much left. And the next day, an additional, additional hundred soldiers showed up. And they, they fought on that day what is known as a pitched battle. A pitched battle is where you got one line here, another line here, and they just come together and fight. Now that's the way the Europeans fought for centuries. The Apaches generally used guerrilla warfare, in, out, quick, in the bushes, all that sort of thing. This was highly unusual. At the end of two hours, Geronimo only had a knife and a saber, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and every time he would charge into the fray, the Mexicans would scream out, St. Jerome, look out. St. Jerome, they're coming again. St. Jerome in Spanish sounds a lot like Geronimo. He got that name and it stuck with him. Uh, for the next 10 years, Geronimo would lead raids, war parties into Mexico. Uh, the war parties were sometimes 200. If they were going on a raid, 25 to 30. Okay. His wounds, he documented these late in his life. He said this, I was shot in the right leg above the knee and I still have that bullet in me. I was shot through the left forearm, wounded with a saber on my right leg below the knee, struck in top of the head with the butt of a musket. Uh, when he got that, it knocked him out. They thought he was dead and then he got up and joined the battle again. I mean, that helped his legend. Uh, he was shot just below the corner of his left eye, 
and it went through his forehead and creased his forehead. He looked mean after that. Uh, he was shot in his left side, shot in the back. One of his fingers was hit by a bullet and was permanently bent backwards, but no bullet ever killed him. And that was his. Uh, and, then, and then Coach Leach used this commentary. He said, one of the things about Apache is they never made an excuse for failure. Uh, what they did was they tried to learn from it. They foster mentorship. What you knew as an adult, you were supposed to teach the younger people and train them to do that. You were supposed to focus on yourself, your abilities. Don't worry about the uh, opponents, and, but do take calculated risk. Well, the white men started coming, and the first white man that he probably saw was in about 1851, and they were drawing this line. They were surveyors. That was from the treaty with Mexico, and that was the division line between Arizona and New Mexico and Mexico. They didn't know what they were doing. They liked the, the guys. They didn't attack them. What they did is they tried to ignore the white men, quite honestly. They stayed up in the mountains, watched them do their work down here. They gave the Indians blankets and some food. Uh, but now, in this time frame, from 1846 to 1851, there were a lot of things that were going on. California, 1849, gold was discovered. The miners were coming through this southern, southern route right here. This line right here was the Butterfield Stage Line that ran, and it, of course, went over through Tucson and on up. Uh, the railroad was being built. The United States felt like they owned the property and everybody that was there, and they could do anything with anybody that they want. Gold was also discovered in these mountains right here, and miners came to those mountains. And there were three things that really told Geronimo that he couldn't trust the white man. The first, uh, the Americans call it the Bascom Affair. The Indians call it the cut, cut the tent. Cochise had been out raiding. He comes back, gets a message that uh, Lieutenant Bascom, who's in what is known as Apache Pass, and it's a, right here, and it goes through the mountains where the railroad and all came through, and right near Fort Bowie, and he got word that uh, Lieutenant Bascom wanted to talk to him. So he goes down there. He's talking to him. And he says, there was a boy abducted, and I want him returned, and I know that you have got him. Coach, he said, I've been out of town. I, I don't have this guy. And they said, well, yes, you do. And he said, I don't. And he said, well, I'm going to keep you and your family hostage till you get him returned. Coach, he's ripped out his knife, cut the tent, ran through it, was at the top of the hill before they could get their weapons out to even fire at him. Cochise hollers down, I don't have him. He said, we're still going to keep you kids until you bring him back. There was a uh, stagecoach driver, and the stagecoach driver knew a little Apache. He said, let me go up and talk to him. Big mistake. He got up there. He took him hostage. Cochise said, I got a hostage. Let's swap. <laughs> Lieutenant said, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, about that time, Chief Coloradus and Geronimo were coming back. And they saw and talked to Coach East, and they said, well, we saw a wagon train over there. And he said, go get me some more hostages. So they go raid the wagon train. There's four Mexicans and three Americans. They take the Mexicans, uh, tie them to the wagon wheels, and burn the wagons. Then, you can imagine what happened to the Mexicans when they were doing that. They brought the three Americans over. So the next day, Coach East says, I got four hostages. Let's swap. And they said, no, nope, you just got to bring, uh, bring the boy back. Well, the Apache were very smart in the fact that they evaluated every battle before they fought. The troops were entrenched. There was no way to attack them without losing a lot of warriors. Warriors were an extremely valuable resource. Cochise said, oh, I'll just leave them with you. I'll come back later and get them. So he goes off. But as he goes off, he tells Geronimo and uh, Chief Coloradus said, take care of these four hostages. And they did. They killed them, left their bodies in Apache Pass. Lieutenant Bascom and them found them a little later. It really made Bascom mad. He hung 
Cochise's son and his two nephews in a stand of trees right nearby there and eventually let his wife and kids go. Geronimo said, you can't trust them. You cannot trust the white men. They don't listen to the truth. The second one was a betrayal of, of, of his chief. Uh, chief Colorado was age 73 about this time. He was old and tired. He was un, uh, tired of the pressure that was happening to all of his people and tired of running from the United States troops all the time. So he's trying to make peace. He's gone over to the miners trying to say, look, there's a lot more gold in Mexico. I'll lead you to it if you'll just leave and go. Well, what they did was they, the soldiers took him captive. They had him in a cabin. They stuck their bayonets in the fire while he was asleep. They reached over and burned his bare legs. He jumps up to fight. Two of them shoot him in the chest. The third one shoots him in the head. Uh, they, the next morning, one of them scalps him. They take his body, put it in a ravine, cover it over with rocks. Uh, after they have done that, three days later, they go down and cut his head off. They boil his head, get a skull, and, they, and the rumor is they sent the skull back to Washington, and it was displayed at the Smithsonian. Now, the Smithsonian denies that, but the Apache allude to it that it did happen. So what the government had decided to do, that they were going to take all the Apaches, put them on reservations near the forts is what they were going to do. They sent a guy out there, and his name was uh, Crook, General Crook. They called him the Tan Wolf. Uh, and the reason they called him the Tan Wolf is because he didn't wear the standard cavalry uniform. He wore a tan jacket, tan pants. He knew that blended in with the countryside. He rode a mule. The mule, they traveled in the mountains. He said the mule is much more sure-footed. So he rode a mule. He had a shotgun across the saddle, just as in this picture. That's the way he was every time. What he got there and what he brought into this situation was that he had determined that only an Apache could catch another Apache if that second Apache really didn't want to get caught. So he started recruiting Apaches off the reservation to be Indian scouts. And they started trying to uh, track Geronimo and, and the others. Now, in the meantime, Cochise dies. Cochise, uh, they had been allowed to live at their homestead, which was in this area here. When he died, he told his son, he said, stay on this reservation, just keep the peace. He said he would. What he didn't know was that the United States government had decided they were going to send them all up to the San Carlos Reservation. Uh, and and when after that happened, General Cook was reassigned. They sent him to help a guy named George A. Custer to help the, get the Sioux and the Cheyenne back onto their reservation. Well, we know how that kind of worked out. So then, then they sent a guy named of John Clum. Now, Crook had been a West Point graduate, Civil War veteran. John Clum, who was the white guy in this, this picture right here, he was a civilian contractor. So they sent him in, and he started gathering up. He was the one that had to tell Coach East's son, you can't live where you've been living. You've got to go up to the reservation. He was gathering up all the other Indians in that area, taking them to the reservation up there. They did not like it. Geronimo sensed what was going on, and, and what Geronimo did, he and his best friend, Woe, that's spelled J-U-H, by the way. Whoa. Uh, what they did was that night, they put out all the campfires. They killed the feeble horses that would slow them down, choked the dogs so that they wouldn't bark when they were leaving, and 700 Apache left. And they went south toward the Sierra Madre Mountains, and they got there. Three years later, John Clum hears that 
Geronimo is in a place called Ojo Caliente over here. Now, Geronimo has been down here in the meantime, but here he's up here. So what Clum does is gets 100 Apache scouts, and they go over to Ojo Caliente. When they're coming into town, he keeps 80 outside, takes 20 in with him, so if the, the uh, Geronimo is watching, it's just a small force. Well, the next morning, Geronimo comes in to talk to him, and, and, and I want to read you uh, what Clum said to him. Clum started berating him about killing ranchers, stealing cattle, refusing to come with the other Apache to San Carlos, and he told Geronimo that he would come right now. Clum reported, this is what Geronimo said to him. You talk very brave, but we do not like that kind of talk. We're not going back to San Carlos with you, and unless you are careful, you and your Apache police will not go back to San Carlos either. Your bodies will stay here in Ojo Caliente to make food for the coyotes. Well, <clears throat> at that time, Clum gives a signal. The other 80 Apache rise up. Geronimo is surrounded. Now, Geronimo wanted to fight in his mind, but he thought, I can't be killed by a bullet, but my friends can. I'm going to live to fight another day. So he surrendered. They took him back to San Carlos Reservation. He's back there. They've got him in jail, got him chained up. For four months, they kept him chained up every day. Well, Clum, being the heir, oh, his nickname was Turkey Gobbler. He strutted around all the time, and that's what the Indians call him, turkey gobbler. Well, he was arrogant, strutting around, and he sent a message back to Washington. He said, I've captured Geronimo. I want to raise, and I want more resources. He got a message back, said, you're not going to get either one of those. He got mad and resigned, and he left and went down to Tombstone. Some other Indian agent released Geronimo from his uh, chains, and he went to live with the, one of the Apache bands there. Uh, and for four months, Clum had been plotting and planning Geronimo's execution. Well, all of a sudden, everybody just forgets about it. Now, this is a neat thing. The Indians, even though they're on a reservation, they still have all their weapons. Rifles, knives, bows and arrows, they got to feed themselves. Nobody's feeding them, so when they get ready to rise up, they still have, have weapons. Well, uh, Geronimo left. He broke out on the way. He killed the driver and stole ammunition and guns, and once again, he was living the Apache life, free, down in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico. Uh, but then for some reason, he went back to San Carlos. Don't know why he went back. Don't know if he was just tired of being down there, if his wife wanted to come back to be with family. Don't really know. But he just came back, walked on the reservation, started being a good Indian. Now, the third thing that, that really happened that set Geronimo against the white man happened uh, because of the dreamer. You can pronounce his name. I, that's his, I'm going to call him the Dreamer. Well, the Dreamer was a guy that's about 5'2", 125 pounds, and up in the northern part of the reservation, he went up the mountain, he prayed, he fasted, and when he came down, he was a self-proclaimed uh, mystic, self-proclaimed prophet, healer, and he was telling them that that was his power. And his prophecy was that the white man was going to go away, the dead Indian chiefs were going to rise again, and they were going to live like they did forever. They started having elaborate ghost dances. They started attracting attention of many of the Indians, and they were getting passes to go north to go out and, what, and participate in these dances. The soldiers heard about it. They go up there and say, whoa, we can't have all the Indians gathering together. Here, we've got to have them separated so they arrested the dreamer, and they started to bring him back down to San Carlos headquarters. Well, all the other Indians were just falling along, walking. And they got ready to camp, and the Indians kept getting closer and closer, and they said, y'all got to back up, you got to back up. Don't know who fired the first shot, but there was gunfire between the Indians and the soldiers trying to bring back the dreamer. 
The dreamer was shot in the leg. He was crawling, trying to get to his wife. Another soldier comes up, put a pistol in his mouth, shoots him. He's still crawling, trying to get to his wife. And a civilian uses an axe and splits his head open. And he dies there. Geronimo happened to be up watching that arrest from a distance, not participating. He was just interested in who these people were following. Mike Leach, in his comments, said, as a lesson, you need to be real careful who you follow. Now, that's <laughs> what Mike Leach said. So I think that's an important thing as well. Uh, that happened no north, and if you want to look it up, it's near Sibiquiu, uh, uh Creek. Now, this led, Geronimo said, they've killed my chief. They have killed, uh, our Cochise has died. Now they kill Apaches just for dancing. That's what they do. And he said, I can't stand this anymore. So he plans breakout number two. So he's going to leave, and he does. He's 58 years old at this time, the second major breakout. When they left there, headed toward the Sierra Madres, 15 straight hours they traveled that day, 45 miles is how far they went. One day, walking. Um, they finally got to the Sierra Madre, and, and, and they were going. And in order to get to Sierra Madre, you had to go fairly close to Tombstone. Leaving up on the San Carlos Reservation, coming to the Sierra Madre, here's Tombstone. When Clum left and went to Tombstone, he eventually became mayor. He heard that he had broke out. He said, I'm putting together a posse, y'all, and I'm going to get him. said, last time I arrested him, put him in chains. said, this time I'm going to arrest him, put him in a pine box with a paper lily on his chest. He didn't see hide nor hair of Geronimo, all, and they chased him, what they thought, all the way to the Mexican border. Interesting side note, people he recruited to be in his posse was Wide Earp, Morgan Earp, and Virgil Earp. Three weeks later, two of those guys were at the gunfight of OK Corral. Just, you know, it was a violent place during this time while they, they, they lived there. So Geronimo, he reached there. They had traveled 200 miles at this time now. They were the only Indians that were fighting still for their freedoms. The rest had surrendered and been put back on reservations. And he also became America's most wanted man. Then there were still some Chiricahua up there. Said, I'm going to rescue them. He sent message back, said, I'm coming for y'all. Y'all get ready. They all didn't want to leave. He went back. When he got there, some of them said, well, we don't want to leave. He told his warriors, get them all. We're taking them back. So he took all of them back. When they got back to the Sierra Madres, they had basically the entire Chiricahua nation there. But Geronimo this time made two big mistakes. First time, when he, this time he crossed the border, thought he was safe. You know, they had fought a war. There's an invisible line that the Americans can't cross. Well, there was a guy that General Crook had hired as chief of the Indian Scouts. His name was Al Cyber. And he ran a tough, tough ship, Iron Fist. He said he only had a simple rule. He said, you do what I tell you to do or I'll kill you. And he did, if they didn't. So when they got to the border, he decides he's going to break the law. He breaks the law and comes across the border. Geronimo stops, doesn't put out sentries. They celebrate with Tiswin, and they get attacked the next morning. They lost a great number of the people they broke out. They started running. They went over a mountain. They got to a little place called Al Alisos Creek. The Mexicans were waiting there to ambush him. He lost about 75 Indians at that creek in that ambush. And once again, they had to run over to the mountains uh, to get away from them. Mike Leach said this, there's something you can always learn in failure. You don't make a mistake, but you learn. But the lesson is don't celebrate too soon. It may make you weak. 
uh, and it, he did. He learned. He learned from that. Well, they had been down there for oh, a little over a month, and they needed to supply. So they went to a little place called Casa Grande. Is here. They went in and said, "We want to trade." They said, "Fine." On the third day of peace, the Mexican army attacked them with over 500 soldiers there. They ran back up into the strongholds to get away with get away from them. About this time, the president had sent um, General Crook back, uh, and he was going to take care of the Apache problem. Now, one thing that happened was this: while Geronimo was over at Casa Grande's, he had sent two other chiefs up into Arizona to raid. And they did it, traveled over 4,000 miles, and they came back with a lot of supplies. But one of the things they did was they came across a buckboard. And there was a man by the name of H.C. McComas on that, and his wife and his six-year-old son. They didn't know that he was a federal judge. They killed him, killed his wife, took his son hostage. When they came back, then, oh, and out of that raiding party, there was a guy who uh, was one that had been rescued that didn't want to leave. So he broke off, went back to San Carlos, the reservation. When he got there, he told General Crook, he said, I'm tired of running. I'll be an Apache scout if you just let me stay here with my wife for a while. He said, fine. Oh, his name, nickname was Peaches, by the way. And, and he led... General Crook back to Geronimo's stronghold, a place they had never been attacked before. When they got back, General Crook took his soldiers. He goes up there. Uh, when he gets to the stronghold, he finds that Geronimo is out 120 miles away, that the two other chiefs, Benito and Chateau, are out hunting. Nobody there but women, children. He takes over the camp. So when Geronimo comes back, He's sitting up on top of the mountain, sends down, says, we need to talk. They decide that they're going to surrender because they have no place to run now. They're in a stronghold. So one, what they do is he does surrender. Uh, a little bit later, they carry him back up to the Fort Apache near San Carlos. Then they had a third breakout. In this third breakout, once again, he goes to the stronghold. That's where Geronimo is. And while he takes over the base camp, this man right here is Crook. Right here is Geronimo. Interesting thing. General Crook went through Tombstone on his way down there, got a photographer to go with him. And while they were there talking for three days, they made this picture, and Geronimo had some of his Indian families together. They were taking family portraits <laughs> while they were there. Uh, so it was a really unique situation, the way they respected and talked to one another. But uh, they said they would go back. One by one, the Indian chiefs were surrendering. Everybody, He said it would take him about two months to get there. Took him eight months to get there. Once he got back up there, he was trying to be a good Indian. He couldn't stand it. He broke out again. This time, there were 2,000. Oh, by the way, because Crook didn't bring Geronimo back with him, he let him go to Casa Grande to try to get his people back. General Nelson Miles came. Nelson Miles, at one time, had 5,000 men searching for Geronimo. That was one-fourth of the United States military looking for him. Geronimo was getting tired. And as he was getting tired, they became prisoners of war. Now, the, this is, let me read you what General Miles told Geronimo. He said, if you were, lay down your arms, come with me to Fort Bowie. In five days, you will see your families that are now in Florida. No harm will be done to you. He said, you'll have a house to live in, horses, mews, cattle, plenty of timber, water, grazing land, he told Geronimo that all his past deeds would be forgiven and they'd be wiped away and he could just start a new life. Geronimo didn't believe him, but he had to surrender. Everyone else had. So what they did, 
They got him up to Fort Bowie. They put him on a train. This is a picture of them. And Geronimo is right here. They had already sent the ones that had surrendered earlier. They sent them to Fort Marion in Florida. Uh, Fort Marion, you may recognize this. Fort Marion is now known as the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument in St. Augustine. You may have visited this. The Indians, the other four or 500, lived there. While they were there for a year, about a fourth of them died of malaria and tuberculosis. They finally decided what they were going to do with Geronimo and his 15 or 20 that he had. They sent him to Fort Pickens, Florida. If y'all have ever been to Pensacola Beach, you cross and you get out on the island over Santa Rosa Island, turn right and go to the end of the island, that's Fort Pickens. They stayed there a year. Then they finally decided to put all of them together. They sent them to Mount Vernon then. Mount Vernon, Alabama. <laughs> this was the Mount Vernon military arsenal. It had been in Union hands, Confederate hands, and back to Union hands, and they decommissioned it, and, it, uh, and Geronimo was there, and he stayed there for six years. There was an Army surgeon there who worked how to contain malaria and that sort of thing. He took care of the soldiers and the Chiricahua while they were there. His name was Walter Reed. Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. The, the Indians that died there, what they did was they buried them, but they didn't tell anybody where they buried them. All, all the Indians that died there have unknown and unmarked graves. In 1894 now, oh, let me tell you what happened. While he was in Mobile, something changed. Something changed because they were having Mardi Gras parties in Mobile. And they were inviting the most wanted man in the nation to come to the Mardi Gras parties. Now, he was a prisoner of war. He went to the parties, had guys with him. He'd go to the parties, and then he'd come back. He had a cell. His cell is this room right here. He said he never went in there unless a dignitary came, and then he'd go to his cell. <laughs> but uh, he just wandered around. That's what he did. So in 1894, they decided they were going to send all the Indians back to Fort Seal. But between and during those six years, something changed because... When he was at Fort Pickens, people would come out and look at him in his cell like a caged animal. And here they were talking to him. On the way to Fort Seal, the crowds would gather and they would actually applaud for him. What had changed? They don't address this in the book, but I'm going to tell you what my theory is. My theory is the Civil War had changed. These people, Indians, were in the South. And what many Americans now understood was that people could be heroes, honor, respect, all of those great qualities, and still be on the losing side. And that's what changed and how they thought about Geronimo. He was a prisoner of war, y'all, but in... Uh, 1898, he went to the Omaha World's Fair. He was there for three months. They paid him $45 a month. Still had guards. He was a prisoner of war. In 1901, he went to the Buffalo World's Fair. Stayed there many months. Uh, paid him $45. He was selling his picture now for $2 a piece. They said that when he died, he had over $10,000 in a bank account. In 1904, when he was 81, he went to St. Louis World's Fair Exposition, paid him $100 a month. He was still selling his picture and his autograph. They asked the promoter, said, isn't that a lot to pay an Indian? And he said, yeah, he's kind of expensive, but you know, there's only one Geronimo, and people would pay to come see Geronimo. 
in 1905, he rode his horse in the inaugural parade of Theodore Roosevelt. Four days after that, he got a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Roosevelt, and he talked to him about his situation and the people that were in Fort Seal. Uh, when he left there, he went back with a new mission, and it was to write a book about, about his life and his, his experiences. Uh, now, I told you that he respected family. Family was important. Now, it was important. It was so, he got married nine times. Uh, and his last time to be married was at age 84 in 1907. His immortality, what do people think about him? He did write his book. He dictated it to the superintendent of education of Lawton, Oklahoma, a guy named S.M. Barrett. He had got to know Mr. Barrett, Superintendent Barrett, when he was trying to sell a war bonnet to somebody and he needed an interpreter. Well, they got to talking about old times and Barrett said, yeah, I got wounded by the Mexicans. Well, when he heard that, he got fired up and they became close buddies. And he dictated his book that President Roosevelt had encouraged him to write. And this is what he said in the dedication of his book. Because he has given me permission to tell my story, because he has read that story, he knows I try to speak the truth, because I believe he is fair-minded and will cause more people to receive justice in the future, and because he is the chief of a great people, I dedicate my story of my life to Theodore Roosevelt, the President of the United States. And in that book he said this, it is my land, my home, my father's land to which I now ask to be allowed to return. I want to spend my last days there to be buried among those mountains. If this could be, I might die in peace, feeling that my people placed in their native homes would increase in numbers rather than diminish as at present and that our name would not become extinct. That did not happen. That's his resting place in the Apache Cemetery at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He was frail in late 1908, forgetful, early on a freezing February day, got on his horse, rode from Fort Sill into Lawton, had somebody buy him some whiskey. He was a prisoner of war. He couldn't, they wouldn't let him buy whiskey. Somebody bought him some whiskey. He had a good night. He got on the horse, rode back, rode into the darkness. He crossed a creek, fell off his horse, and he laid half submerged in that creek until he was found the next morning. He was in delirium for three days, and he died of pneumonia on February the 17th, 1909, and he was 85. Now, there are some postscripts that I need, a couple or three I just need to share with you. One of the questions that he was always asked was about killing. He killed people. He fought for the freedom of his people. This is what he said about killing. He said, I have killed many. I do not know how many, for frequently I just didn't count them. He paused, and then he said, some of them were just not worth counting. <laughs> I mean, he had a reason for what he did. The, uh, Chiricahua Indians, for 27 years, they were prisoners of war. Arizona and New Mexico became states in 1912. They were fi finally released from the prisoner of war status in 1913. And the people of Arizona would not let the Chiricahua return to their homeland. And on his deathbed, he whispered this, I should have never surrendered. I should have fought until I was the last man alive. Coach Leach says in his commentary, said you need to have battle scars for fighting for what you believe in. You ought to become a legend through talk, not through talk, but through your deeds. And you ought to live your dreams of living free and try to Live up to your dreams, and most of all, never give up. 
And that is the story of how Geronimo came from the most wanted man in America to one of the most revered that, and we speak his name with honor and respect. Okay, any questions from anyone? I'll be glad to try to give you my opinion or tell you what they said in the book. Any questions about Geronimo? Randy. Yes. This is uh, a somewhat personal question. Were you a fan of Western history before you read this book? I always wanted to be the Indian. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be the underdog. I always wanted to be I, the cowboy. I always, <laughs> wanted, I always wanted to be the underdog and be able to perform better than anyone ever thought that I could perform. That well, was, and you uh, did. I, I, the Lord has blessed me in many ways. He has blessed me in many ways, yes. Any other comments or questions? Oh, one question, Ms. Croxton, you asked me this earlier. How did the paratroopers come to say Geronimo when they jumped out of the plane? I don't want to burst Coach Leach and Mr. Levy's bubble on this. But what happened was in the early 1940s, paratroopers were training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And while they were down there, they were, of course, preparing for the invasion. And they were going to use paratroopers. Well, they were doing individual jumps out of airplanes. And they had told them that in order for to get enough men on the ground fast enough, they were going to have to do the chain jumping. In other words, they would just jump one right after the other out of the airplane. And it would be at least four men out of the airplane before any parachute opened. This was brand new, and it was frightening to a lot of the men that were going to do it. Some of the soldiers had gone to a movie, and it was a movie about Geronimo. Mm -hmm. They were picking on this guy and said, you're going to be so scared tomorrow, you won't even know your name. He said, I tell you what. He said, I'm not scared. And I'll yell the name Geronimo when I jump out of that plane. And I'll tell you right now. The next day, half the troop was on the plane, half was on the ground watching. They started the chain jumping. When the fourth man come out of the plane, the people on the ground could hear Geronimo. And more that jumped out of the plane yelled Geronimo as well. So that's how it's reported that it actually happened, that they did. But it was because he wasn't scared to do his job for his country. Okay, any other side bits? That's not in the book, by the way. You had to read the book. Okay, I appreciate everyone. I appreciate the offer of coming today. I had a great time. I had a great time. Thank you all for coming. June 28th, we'll have Dr. Francis Williams speaking on U.S. Grant. So I uh, hope to see you there.